let me start with my definition of what I believe marketing is, and that's what gets people in the door and PR is what keeps people coming back. So long gone are the days where we are simply just mouthpieces pushing out messaging. We're really the people that are helping to build the relationships on behalf of the brand, and that's not just done through the media. Welcome to the Smart Talk series, the show for professionals who want strategies, tips, and real talk about all things PR, marketing, and social media. Your host is Melissa Vela Williamson, an award-winning, accredited, and nationally recognized PR pro and communication thought leader. And now your host, Melissa Vela Williamson. Hello, and welcome to the Smart Talk series. I'm Melissa Vela Williamson. This season, our focus is on communication specialties. Today, I'm joined by Sarah Evans. Sarah Evans, founder of Seven Strategies and Seven's Digital PR, is a digital PR strategist, consultant, global brand correspondent, and keynote speaker who speaks with companies worldwide to create and improve their social and digital PR strategies. Her team is able to advise on branding, marketing, advertising, and public relations. Additionally, Sarah has been a digital correspondent for several companies, including PayPal, Cox Communications, MGM International, Cisco, SAP, Walmart, Shorty Awards, and more. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, thanks so much for having me today. Absolutely. I'm so excited to speak with you here. Tell us a little bit more about your background and your work at Seven Strategy and Digital PR. Well, I founded Seven Strategy 11 years ago now when I worked myself out of a safe, steady job coming from corporate America. I was consulting in the after hours uh, because social media was new and people were trying to figure out how to integrate their PR campaigns with the rise of social uh, and created Seven Strategy. We've pivoted several times over the past several years, but have grown into a mid-size agency with an intense focus on digital PR, uh, meaning we do everything from uh, mainstream media relations to fully uh, digitally integrated PR campaigns. And on the flip side, the seven strategy side of things is really just me consulting with teams that already have in-house PR who really need kind of a pitch hitter or someone to come in and do some digital transformation training. So I get to run the gamut and no two clients are alike and really passionate about what we do. I love all that. I talk a lot about integrated marketing communications. And one of the things that attracted me to you, I think I found you first on Twitter, was that you did seem to talk about that intersection and integration between social media and public relations and what's happening in digital marketing. I think we need to know about all sides of that house. And, you know, if we have a specialty in one, that's great, but they all should work together in the right direction. And in that spirit, you do so much great conversations around digital tools and PR. So what does this digital PR mean to you? Well, let me start with my definition of what I believe marketing is, and that's what gets people in the door and PR is what keeps people coming back. So long gone are the days where we are simply just mouthpieces pushing out messaging. We're really the people that are helping to build the relationships on behalf of the brand. And that's not just done through the media. At a very basic level, it might mean, yes, we secure great media placement for our clients, but now what do we do with that? And how does that further a campaign? Does that mean that they're now engaging with the journalists on social media? Maybe they're asking customers for feedback about that article. Are they running third party related social ads um, or ad campaigns targeting potential customers using that piece of media as a validation point. The, The scope is endless, but it really means fully thinking about the landscape at our disposal and how we're going to keep those people coming back. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that if the messaging or the story is not consistent across all those platforms, but of course, tailored for the different audiences and the nuances of the culture of those platforms, we're really missing a huge part of making it believable and trustworthy for our audiences. So that's really perfect. So our theme this season, I'm really digging into what are the specialties within public relations and communication? What kind of specialties are you seeing emerging from leaders in PR today? This may not seem like an aha moment or expert uh, or a a big surprise, (laughs) but I think 
due to COVID, some things have shifted and changed. Um, It might be my bias for what I do in my day job, but I'm seeing a huge emphasis put back on the strategy side of things and and the scope and being able to build out a very highbrow strategic plan and then distill it down tactically and then actually have it executed. I think there was some panic at the onset of COVID with people and clients very concerned with how they were going to get media, especially with the media cycle changing so frequently and with the pandemic kind of taking front and center stage, um, that people were very focused on just get media, just get me a placement. And now we're shifting back to let's really see what's possible from that brainy strategic standpoint. Yeah, I think those who did really well during the pandemic, particularly if they were in public relations, were those who had more of that counselor or advisor role and were strategic in their thinking, their approach, and weren't just going after every tactical opportunity out there. Because people like me had an eye for, well, what are the results that I want in 12 months from now? Like, what can I imagine that's coming around the corner after the pandemic kind of shifts a little bit? So I think you're right. And I think that embracing that strategy, those are the real leaders in our industry. I I believe in that too. So, well, you're always very generous from what I see with praise. You share a lot of accolades. You ask open questions and, and really work to engage an audience on your channels. You definitely share different contacts and tools. I love your newsletter. It's full of all the really great tools that you know, sometimes I get overwhelmed, like, gosh, I'm just going to save this newsletter because I can't even dig into it today. But what's really inspired you to be so generous with your praise and contacts and tools? Well, on the flip side, the the generosity comes from a selfish place in that I am an avid learner. And the more that I share, I feel that more people respond and I learn something new. In fact, I challenge myself every day if I'm reading a newsletter, having a meeting with someone, what is one thing I can learn from that person and how can I apply it either to my personal life or my professional life? So that's one part of it. The other part is the whole idea of digital legacy. And I talk to brands about this all of the time, but it really started from a personal mission that my children will be able to have a digital archive of what I share, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, be my great-great-grandchildren. And what do I want them to see about me? Do I want them to see me sharing memes or complaining about customer service? And for me, in my roadmap, it was sharing my daily reflections and then watching me grow as a professional and having some sort of archive of that growth. You you and I think alike, Sarah. I think about legacy a lot. I love that term, digital Mm -hmm. legacy, and what's going to be out there. And like we see every day, some of the worst case studies and examples we see and public relations are someone tried to be funny 10 years ago. And because what you think is funny today or was a good idea today may not be tomorrow. So yes, I appreciate your thoughtfulness around what you're sharing and that legacy you want to leave behind you, both for your children and your family, but also within the industry and with other pros too. Wonderful. And that's a great kind of segue into some uh, another question I had thought about for you. When I think about public relations, sometimes I have to explain to clients like, you know, We may not, as individual professionals, and and when I do coaching around our own personal brands, like we may not be as flashy as a a social media influencer may be, right? I may not be so worried about the aesthetics Mm -hmm. in some ways, but an interesting juxtaposition for me, I find that someone who has so much substance like you also has a great massive following on Twitter, for example. So how did you end up becoming such an influencer in this space? Well, I'll tell you that, but I also have a really, well, I think is fun, but probably nerdy fun um, anecdote. So, (laughs) you know, I've built up a following on Twitter over the past, I don't know, 12 plus years. And I don't know that I necessarily had a strategy around it, except that I was going to talk about PR and social media. About three and a half, now maybe four months ago, I decided I wanted to get into doing my own investing. And I was looking at different uh, investing apps that also had a social networking component so I could connect with other people about what I was investing in. Or And um, I decided to get on the app called Public and I focused on tech only. I thought the, the investing landscape is so big. I've got such a learning curve ahead of me. I'm going to just focus on technology. And I started sharing what I was researching, a very similar strategy like Twitter, but only focused on investing. And 
over those four months, somehow found myself verified there, 150,000 followers. I signed a deal for one of their first live audio shows. And then now being contacted from other brands about being a financial influencer. And I keep telling people I'm not a financial influencer because they said, well, what was your strategy? I said, nothing except that I wanted to learn. And it's a very similar approach to Twitter that sometimes influence finds you simply by being intentional with your voice, knowing what you will and will not talk about. And I don't know if it's imposter syndrome, but I truly don't feel like I'm a, a financial influencer. I'd be much more comfortable saying I was a PR influencer or something in that space. But Twitter's been, when you look at the terms of numbers, Twitter's been a very slow growth versus something like public that I just jumped on and started using. And a lot of people on places like TikTok find themselves influencers overnight because it's one of the fastest platforms to grow influence. Um, so not a great answer, but simply that I was intentional, knew what I would and wouldn't talk about, and um, am very consistent with what I post and engage. Well, I think that makes a lot of sense in some ways. It's like the brand pillars we set up for our clients and say, you know, these are the things that you stand for and prove that with your messaging, your stories, the things you spend time on, the things that you give treasure to, right? And I will give you that title. Mm -hmm. You are a PR influencer. I think it's unique. I think a lot of PR professionals have that imposter syndrome when it comes to that influencer title. But what we have to say, I mean, the origin story for influencers was about someone who really could lead people, not just from the stories they told, the resources they could share, the insight they had into a category or a community. So absolutely, I think a lot of PR people are influencers. We're kind of built to think of ourselves as back of the house or putting our clients first and people first, which we absolutely do. But I think if you're doing it right, like someone like you, that you will draw people to you and you will have a natural following that grows over time because of your consistency. So good job there, Sarah. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and you mentioned TikTok and I just, oh, I cover my eyes because I think about TikTok and I see it's interesting to me to kind of audit professionals that I may know or follow and they have one persona on Twitter or one persona on LinkedIn, right? That's very professional, very buttoned up. And then on TikTok, they're like all over the place and dancing and having their best lives in all kinds of colorful ways that may not necessarily be, you know, professionally as in the box as we're used to. So I find that interesting. And how are you advising clients when you talk about TikTok? Because for some people that can feel very vulnerable trying to be in that space where it's so dance and aesthetically oriented. So I'm glad you said that. And it's so funny you bring up the word persona because I was just advising on something similar yesterday. And it wasn't somebody was asking or questioning about where their priorities should be. And they realized, had an aha moment, that it wasn't about prioritizing which social networks. It was about this breakdown in personas. We were discussing how they built up this very specific brand. And if they were to get on TikTok or somewhere that they had to change that. And it was because someone sent them a video of a dancing girl. And they said, and this was a female client, and they said, here's what you could model. She said, but I wouldn't be dancing on TikTok. And this is so far off what I would ever share. Mm. So we really started talking about not doing it like everyone else, but what are all the tools within TikTok and the different hashtags and communication threads where what she has to share could be valuable. And she's actually in the finance space, ironically. And we kind of built that out of what that could look like. And it looked nothing like a dancing girl, but something that was very much in her wheelhouse to give people something that they could use with that financial information and drive them back to other channels for more long form content. Yeah, that's absolutely the right approach. And I've actually seen quite a few financial literacy influencers making these TikTok videos and like you said, cross promoting them on other channels. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of a catchy way that I see a lot of the pointing, right? Like pointing to different mm -hmm. tips in the videos. And I, yes. it's an interesting different way to kind of consume that information. And I will say people love to talk about money. They want to learn about money. They want to get more money. So it's something to definitely explore. I love the way you approach that with your client. And, you know, when I think about digital marketing and digital media and social media, 
What that leads me to consider is how PR people and marketing people and what I've seen over my career, I've been in it over 17 years now, is the literally like coming to fruition of using social media for business and the actual like segregation between departments and divisions and now even within the agency world how it's kind of a little push and pull on who owns social media and who owns digital and how they put that to work. And for me, it seems to be, what is your point of view and your mindset when you come to these channels that makes all the difference? So if we think just about public relations and PR people, what should PR people be thinking about or our PR pros be thinking about when it comes to using digital in our work? Um, the short answer is yes. And I think it comes down to the relationship building side of things. I know that there are several big and mid-size, even small companies where marketing, comms, PR are, are still battling to figure out how they all integrate. Is it the CMO that oversees PR? Is, is there a comms person, a marketing person in charge of it all? And then social gets kind of rolled in there. But when I'm at least advising or working with clients, I don't necessarily care who owns social, but I break it out by the relationship side and the paid side. So are we going to be using ads to further some of these messages? And on the non-paid side, what role does it play? And how are we going to utilize it? everything from how we're going to tag and engage to what type of visual audio or otherwise content are we going to share and look at it from an engagement standpoint and what content will be most likely to get people to comment, share, engage versus maybe marketing that would come in and say, well, we're going to be doing some sponsored posts or amplified messaging to get people to the point where they'd want to engage. Got it. That That's a great illustration of how that all comes together and then kind of comes apart too. Well, there's a lot out there and there's more every day. I mean, you mentioned another platform I had not even heard about. So I'm like, I need to look that up and add that to my roster. But are there any digital strategies or tactics that seem to be especially vital to learn about lately? I feel like I'm so immersed in this. I mean, this is every single day I spend time just learning to see what kind of traffic is referring elsewhere, where are people sharing everything from the discords of the world to subreddits and, and how those kind of all intertwine. At a very basic level, one of my go-tos for anything strategy, and it might seem very simplistic, are the hand curated Twitter lists that I create. Um, and I'll do them around different topicals, hashtags. I do tons of media Twitter lists. And I set up shortcuts on my phone to remind me to check in with those links every day just to see what people are talking about as a jumping off point. Many times the content being shared there might lead me somewhere else. And I'll go down a rabbit hole of a new tool, a new resource, a new subreddit, a new channel or place people are talking. And then what I typically do is take some think time uh, that I block off every morning to think about how this could all be used either for existing clients or um, I'd love to challenge myself to think about the PR industry overall and share you know, tips, tools, or resources to my peers to see how we can do things better. That's smart. I was good about the Twitter list for a while and I totally fell off that wagon. I know I use Twitter in particular to keep up with like you said, emerging trends, what's coming down in terms of media coverage? Is there anything that's happening at the national, international level that I need to think about? But when it comes to journalists too, that seems to be their favorite platform, or maybe culturally they're kind of being inspired to use it more. But are you finding that that's a great tool for you to engage with journalists or how are you using that and more on the media relations side? I would say 80% of the last year's worth of media mentions I've secured have come through engaging with journalists on Twitter or via DMs. Fantastic. And like, when do you find like it's appropriate or okay to DM a journalist? And when you're like, is there some kind of culture around that? Uh, so here's what I want to do. I'll give you my kind of, and I use that uh, very intentionally. Right. Many times journalists, I, I don't even want to say many times, I look at their bios first. Um, some journalists will actually preface and say DMs open or do not DM me. I will hate you forever. So I keep a, in my master kind of media lists and, and guide, I'll put who has different preferences where. 
a lot of it is just over time building a relationship. It's not that I just jump on and find someone new and, and direct a message them. But if someone follows me back or I follow them, I'll just do a hello and check in and let it kind of evolve from there. I also am very intentional. If I've got a story in the disinformation space and I know a journalist who is currently working on something in disinfo and I am sure that his inbox and signal is full, I'll just send him or her, I'm just thinking of one in particular, I'll send him a DM and he gets back to me really quick. And we've just kind of informally established that that's a way that we'll communicate. Yeah, I've definitely seen more of an openness with direct messaging on Twitter, online, and also for sure text with journalists over these last pandemic months. Yes, absolutely. It, it just became a Especially must. TV producers. Yeah, it became a must <laughs> because, you know, they were displaced from their offices. They didn't have the same kind of phone connections. Email just became, I mean, it was always crazy. Email's always crazy for them and for us too. Yes. But it just became probably insurmountable. And so getting to them quickly by message, that, that wall came down pretty darn quickly. And so the amount of collaboration has been inspiring. I hope that definitely continues that openness. Same. I'm all for it. <laughs> so Sarah, uh, you're obviously a super intelligent person. I enjoy your content. I enjoy speaking with you. I like to ask all my guests a question because I'm kind of intrigued about this concept, but what does smart talk mean to you? Oh, smart talk to me means remaining curious. I'd say if I had to think about my youth and childhood, even up to my collegiate level, there are companies that I would have been afraid to apply for that I'm now consulting or working with. And it wasn't because I necessarily think I'm smarter than anyone in the room. It's because I'm a voracious learner and constantly curious and want to learn from everyone. And that helps me with smart talk. I hope that's not too general, but everything for me always comes back to wanting to learn because I don't view myself as an expert in all areas, but I definitely want to learn as much as possible while I'm here. No, that's powerful. And I completely agree. That's kind of my spirit too. I'm always looking up things. I'm always reading about things. I'm always talking with people about things. And, and if I don't know the answer, I'm going to go find it because now I'm completely intrigued and I can't even go to bed without figuring that out. So absolutely. <laughs> Sarah, what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you after this great conversation today? You can always find me on Twitter at PR Sarah Evans with an H and you can DM me and we can make anything happen from there. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Sarah, for sharing your knowledge and information with us today. Thank you. Thanks to our listeners for joining me for today's episode. We're creating this podcast with you in mind. Leave us a rating or review to share what you find valuable. Help us reach more pros by sharing episodes you've learned from. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. And as always, think smart and communicate smart. And I'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Smart Talk series. If you learned something or enjoyed our conversation, share it on social media or send to a friend. To learn more about this and other communication topics, visit mvw360.com. That's mvw360.com.